as many types of witnesses to deal with as there are types of human beings, each with his own individual way of looking at things, his own prejudices, and his own mental barriers. The case we shall study now required a great deal of discretion and good judgment by the interviewer. The complainant in this case was Miss Marie Sheridan, age 28, occupation waitress. Now, Miss Sheridan came to the military police station at 1500 hours, Friday, 29 April. She told the desk sergeant she'd been assaulted and beaten by a private James McNaughton, 303rd Field Artillery Battalion. And the desk sergeant, after recording the necessary facts, referred her at once to the military police criminal investigators. Specialist First Class Greer is listening to her complaint in the investigator's office. He has recently been assigned to the Military Police Criminal Investigation Program and has a tendency to accept a story at its face value. Now notice that Specialist Greer has failed to take proper precautionary measures when interviewing a female. These situations are difficult to handle. You, you've got to arrest him. I mean, court-martial him. It's what he deserves. It's getting so that a girl can't even just look at a soldier without getting in trouble. Just what did he do to you, Miss Sheridan? He hit me. And then he called me bad names. I thought he was going to do something awful. I didn't know. Where did this happen? In his car. Outside the Red Mill Cafe. Oh, I was really frightened. He practically dragged me out of the car, and then he hit me. Uh, luckily, I got away, and I ran down the street, and finally got home. Well, when did this happen? The night before last, about two in the morning. Oh, it was awful. I don't know what he would have done if I hadn't gotten away. I mean, just look what he did to my coat. Just look. And he's going to have to pay for that, too. Well, these situations are difficult to handle. Well, you're going to arrest him, aren't you? We'll get in touch with his unit right away. Excuse me. Mr. Bennett? Mr. Bennett? There's a girl here who's been assaulted by a soldier. She's pretty upset. I think we better have the soldier picked up for questioning. What's it all about? Well, she was in this car with a soldier named McNaughton, 303rd. Assault is a serious matter any time, and especially so against a woman. But it's also a difficult offense to deal with. Proof is often hard to establish, and lots of human factors, mostly emotional, may influence the case. The investigator must know the elements of proof before beginning an interview. He must be cautious all the way. He cannot accept a story at its face value. He must establish all the facts. After learning the nature of the complaint, Chief Warrant Officer Bennett decides to get more details before having the soldier picked up. Since the complainant is a female, he sends for a woman clerk from the main office outside to be present in the room during the interview. This should always be done as a matter of self-protection for the investigators. If no other woman is available, any disinterested third party will do. Specialist Greer failed to take this precaution. I'm awfully sorry if a soldier has hurt you in any way, Miss Sheridan. We'll do everything we can to help you. Oh. I just don't want any other girl to have to go through what I went through. Of course not, but... Well, I was just wondering why you didn't report this incident sooner. Well, I was so upset about the way he acted, about my co about everything. And then I was telling my girlfriend all about it, naturally, and... See, you have a cigarette on wall. Sure. The girl's delay in reporting the incident may or may not have been justified, but it suggests that a closer look is needed at all the circumstances. Thanks a lot. You, uh, mentioned your girlfriend. Oh, yeah, well, I told her all about it, and when she found out about the coat, she wanted us to go right out to the camp and report it to Jimmy's commander. But I was so upset. How long have you known Jimmy? Oh, a month. Maybe a little longer. Had you been out with him much before this last time? 
three, four times maybe. Did he ever try to molest you before? Well, he got fresh with me once, but I put a stop to that. Then he tried again the other night, and I made him quit. That's when he got rough. Were you uh, sitting in his car when he got rough? Yeah. Then what happened? Well, then I got out. I was trying to get away from him. That's when he made me tear my coat on the handles of the door. Look, see? That's what he did to my coat. And then he started to talk nasty to me, call me bad names. I tried to make him behave, but he just wouldn't. Oh, he has a terrible temper. When you got out of the car, did Jimmy get out the same side as you? Yes, he slid over and got out after me. I said to him, look, look what you did to my coat. It's the only decent coat I got, and you ruined it. Well, I, he cared. Let's see. You got out of the car yourself. He didn't get out first, then pull you out. No, after he, he slapped me, I was trying to get away. Her original statement was that the soldier had dragged her out of the car. There's also a difference between being hit and being slapped. As I understand it, then, while you were sitting in the car with Jimmy, he struck you with his open hand, is that right? Yes, and it stung hard. Had Jimmy been drinking quite a bit? Yeah, we had a couple. Oh, you both had, huh? Yeah, but I was okay. I wasn't drunk or anything. When I got home, I was so upset I had to take some medicine. What kind of medicine was that? Some kind of sedative. I was nervous. My girlfriend wanted me to call a doctor. Boy, was she sore when she saw that coat. Forty-nine fifty I paid for that, and not three weeks ago. You just have to get a new coat. Have you seen Jimmy since Wednesday night? No. Do you expect to see him soon again? Hmm. If he was any kind of gentleman, he would have come over and apologized and offered to pay for the coat. But he won't. Not if I know him. You said that you and Jimmy had quite a bit to drink Wednesday night. Do you recall how much? No. But I remember Jimmy said he hadn't had any supper. And you know how it is, drinking on an empty stomach. Mm -hmm. What'd you have to drink? Well, I was drinking highballs mostly. I think Jimmy was too. Yes, in fact, I'm sure he was. Do you remember where you went? Sure. We went to two places before we went to the Red Mill. First, we went to that Joe's place out on the highway, and then we went to the little Kruger's bar down on South Street. I guess you were both feeling pretty good by the time this incident took place in the car. Yeah. Oh, I was okay, but Jim was feeling pretty high. I guess he thought it was the other way around, though. Did he? I gave him the back of my hand good. Oh, uh, you slapped him, did you? Sure. I had to put a stop to that. And, uh... Then he got a little rough himself, is that right? That's right. That's when little Marie decided to clear out. That's when he made me tear my coat. Look at it. Did I tell you I only had a three weeks? Let's see now. You and Jimmy went to uh, Joe's place, was it? Then Kruger's, then the Red Mill. Is that right? That's right. Were you seen there by anyone you know? No. And the... Uh, Bartenders at these places, do they know you? Yeah. Well, I guess so. Maybe. Oh, they might remember me. Why? Well, we'll have to take statements from the witnesses at these places that you and Jimmy visited Wednesday night, I imagine. Well, what for? I showed you what he did, and I told you how he caused it. Isn't that enough to make him pay for it? Who pays for the code is not in our jurisdiction, Miss Sheridan. I'm talking about the charge of assault. We have to establish the background and the events of the evening leading up to the assault. Oh, yeah? You see, if it comes to a court-martial, Jimmy's defense counsel asks you and all the witnesses a lot of questions. We have to ask the same sort of thing to establish the circumstances surrounding the complaint. Well, will I have to show up at the court-martial? If there is one, you will certainly be called, I'm sure. Oh. Assault is a serious matter. A conviction of that offense puts a black mark on a soldier's record. 
that's why we have to develop all the facts of the case beforehand now if jimmy really did assault you the army will take action but before any action can be taken against jimmy the facts must show he has committed an offense look i just want him to do what's right that's all i mean see i have a girlfriend and her girlfriend is a legal secretary, and she said that Jimmy could be made to pay for the coat. Now, isn't that right? Frankly, I don't know. That's not in our jurisdiction. Well, couldn't you talk to Jimmy's commanding officer or somebody and tell him what he's got to do? That's all I want. Have you talked to Jimmy about it? Well, no. I haven't seen him since Wednesday night. Maybe you could work something out with him yourself. Oh, well, I don't think there's much chance of that. Maybe I could tell him he could be forced to pay. Maybe I could tell him that I spoke to somebody who knows the law. Do you know how long it takes to save forty-nine fifty on a waitress's pay? Ask her, she'll tell you. I can't go around buying coats like this every month. Just look at that material. The case of Marie Sheridan is a pointed illustration of rule number one for all investigators. Never accept any story at face value. Now let's review the case for a moment. The investigator who heard her original complaint, which sounded like an aggravated assault, was ready to take action first and ask questions later. But the more experienced investigator wanted more details first and found that while there was a lot of smoke, there was very little fire. What sounded like a serious assault turned into a rather minor assault which was at least in part provoked by the complainant's own action. Her motive in making the charge was simply to get a new coat. Marie refused to sign the statement when she learned that assault is a serious offense. The investigation was completed, however, and a report made to Private McNaughton's commanding officer. Now, the complainant who has an ulterior motive, uh, who exaggerates, or who in many cases makes a completely false charge, is a rather common type. For example, the motive might be jealousy, or spite, or injured feeling. Or in the case of some women complainants, simply that they didn't get paid enough. And the complaint may run anywhere from a simple assault to rape. But let me make one thing perfectly clear. Don't make the mistake of thinking that a person of poor reputation or easy virtue doesn't deserve your consideration. An assault is still an assault, a crime is still a crime, regardless of whether or not the victim is a nice person. Just make sure whether or not the offense as charged has really been committed. And one good place to look is in the mind and motives of the complainant. Now let's consider another type of witness. Oh, yes. Here is the case of Private Arnold Douglas, charged with malicious destruction of property at the Apache Bar and Grill, and assault on the proprietor of same because of an argument involving the proprietor's wife. It happened about 2 a.m. after an evening of drinking by the accused. There were several witnesses to the conduct of the accused during the evening. One of these witnesses was his buddy, Private Charles Gibbons. Now, ordinarily, a witness is interviewed at his place of duty or in his quarters. But in this case, the investigators had reason to believe that Gibbons might be an unwilling witness. So they brought him to the office for questioning. The investigators have just finished interviewing the proprietor of the Apache Bar. Well, as a rule, civilians feel more at ease when the investigators are in street clothes. A good relationship with witnesses and suspects, be they military or civilian, is always helpful at least initially. With servicemen, this can often be achieved by the use of given names. As for this soldier witness, from information already received, the investigators were reasonably sure that Gibbons himself was innocent. Well, as I told you, Charlie, we're looking into that business at the Apache last night concerning Private Douglas. I don't know anything about it. You were in the Apache, weren't you? Yeah, for a little while. You came in with Douglas, didn't you? Yeah. You left when Douglas left. 
didn't you? Yeah. So you must know something about what Douglas did while he was in there. Don't you, Charlie? Not too much, no. Why not? I had too many beers. I don't remember so good. Oh, I see. What's the trouble, Charlie? My head's busting. I need an aspirin. I'll get you a drink of water. An obstinate witness can think of lots of ways of ducking the issue. Remember, this man is hostile for a reason. The suspect is known to be Gibbon's best friend, and the witness is determined to protect him. How many beers did you have, Charlie? I don't know, six or eight, maybe. Your memory's not so good, huh? Kind of hazy, all right. You remember throwing that chair through the bar window? Don't give me that. I never threw any chair. How do you know? You say you can't remember. I never threw anything. Somebody did. Somebody threw a lot of things. Chairs, bottles, all sorts of things. Somebody gave the bartender a black eye and a cut lip, too. You remember any of that? It wasn't me. I remember that much. We thought all along it was Douglas. But maybe you had something to do with it and don't remember any of it. No, sir. I didn't. I had nothing to do with any of that stuff. Well, then tell me what happened then. I don't have to talk about it. I've got my rights. Well, then you were involved. No, sir. I didn't have anything to do with it. Charlie, I don't think you understand your rights under the 31st article. Maybe I'd better read paragraphs A and B to you. No person subject to this code shall... Witnesses who don't want to talk often make the mistake of thinking the 31st article excuses them from answering. And they have to be shown that this article does provide a right to remain silent in the cases of suspects and persons who may incriminate themselves. But it does not give an innocent witness who is not a suspect the right to refuse to answer questions concerning an offense under investigation. Used or suspected. And that any statement made by him may be used as evidence against him in a trial by court martial. Now, you see what it says there, Charlie? Any man who's involved in an offense is protected, but an innocent bystander is not covered. Now, if you took part in that affair at the Apache, you may remain silent. Honest, I didn't have anything to do with it. You're an innocent bystander, is that right? That's right. Okay, then. We know you and Douglas are buddies and you want to help him out, but you're not covered by the 31st article and you can't refuse to answer questions. Now, what did the bartender's wife have to do with this? Was she giving Douglas the eye or what? Is that how this got started? I guess so. I wish we'd never gone into that place. How many other people were in the place when Douglas started throwing things around? A couple of others, I guess. I don't know. Well, how many times did the bartender tell Douglas to keep away from his wife? I don't know. Look, why don't you ask Douglas himself? I don't want to talk about this. I'm no stool pigeon. I know how you feel, Charlie. Believe me, but you got the wrong slant on this. All of the other witnesses are on the bartender's side. They're all prejudiced in his favor. Now, we want to know what happened from your side of the table. You're not doing your buddy any good by saying you don't know or you don't remember. So far, everything we've got makes it look pretty bad for Douglas. If you want to really help him, tell us the straight dope on what happened. Okay. What do you want to know? Well, first, when did you leave camp? About 6.30, I guess, something like that. Did you meet Douglas in town, or did he go in with you from camp? I met him in town. OK. Now, tell us in your own words about everything that happened from the time you and Douglas arrived at the Apache. Well, Charlie told the whole story then, slanting it in favor of his buddy, of course, and giving plenty of facts to confirm the essential parts of the other witnesses' story. As you've seen and heard, he put up quite a little resistance before he talked. First, he said he'd had so many beers he couldn't remember. But when it was suggested that Charlie himself might have been involved, 
His memory suddenly became very clear. Next, he claimed protection under the 31st article. But the investigator pointed out to him that he could not remain silent because he was an innocent bystander. Finally, Gibbons said he didn't want to be a stool pigeon, and that's quite understandable. But justice can't stand aside for personal loyalties, or there'd be no justice. Now, let's look once more at the two types of witnesses we have seen. There was Marie Sheridan, who made an exaggerated complaint in order to make her boyfriend buy her a new coat. And Private Gibbons, the hostile witness who didn't want to talk. A good knowledge of human nature in general and human motives in particular form the basis of approach in each of these cases. A thorough knowledge of good interview and interrogation techniques made it possible to get at the truth in the end. <laughs>